welcome to the episode of Jim's Open Garden. Like most people this time of year, you've probably got a glut of um, tomatoes, and what I'm going to do is basically pick everything off because I'm uh, going to be going off on holiday shortly, so I don't want to leave anything in here which is going to effectively ripen. So even the ones that aren't 100% ripe yet, um, I think that one I can possibly leave. Um, what I'm going to do is pick them all off, and all I'm going to do is chop these um, in half uh, or into quarters, and then um, just boil them up um, in a saucepan with some with some herbs and uh, I'm going to uh, basically make up like a like a pasta tomato sauce and what you can do with this is um, just put it into um, some containers and freeze it it'll, it'll keep good in the uh, it'll keep good in the freezer for quite a few months to come so what you can do is basically um, do a, a whole sort of batch um, if you're going on holiday like me, or if you've just got loads of tomatoes coming all all together, and you just can't um, you, you just can't get around to eating them. Um, so what I would suggest you do is do exactly what I do. You know, pick them all like this. Um, anything that's sort of close to being ripe, obviously these ones here are, are really ripe. Um, and then basically boil them up with some um, with some herbs. And all I'm going to put in there is some um, oregano, thyme, and basil. Um, which always go well with um, uh, tomatoes. Now tomatoes have got their own sort of salt really so you don't really need to season them as such. I might put a little bit of black pepper in there. Um, and then as soon as they've um, boiled up, I like to leave the skins on because the skins are where all the, the sort of the vitamins and the, and the goodness is. So what I will do is um, boil them up with the, you know, with the skins in there as well and then with a liquidizer at the end, um, like a handheld blender, I'll just um, Go through and sort of liquidise it if you like, which will basically just chop all the uh, chop all of the um, skins up, um, and then that'll be uh, it'll be great for um, pasta sauce. So I'll just carry on picking these. I have got some over here, as you can see, these are the ones that um, that, that came off that other plant. Um, that one's got a little bit of a black spot, on, but I can cut that off. Um, and those will those will uh, cook up just as well as the others. Even even some that have gone slightly too ripe, you know, you can do this with. In fact, to be honest with you, they're all the sweeter if you uh, use the ones that have possibly gone a little bit too far. Um, and I'll uh, I'll just do that and bite it in some containers, freeze it, and then that'll keep for quite a few months to come. So the tomatoes, uh, basically what you can do is you can um, you can put um, onion or garlic or you can actually put olives in there if you wanted to. If you, you know, so it depends on what you want to um, use it for. With these um, tomatoes, all I've done basically is, is, is just, um, just sort of chopped them up, um, boiled them down for, it takes around probably about an hour or so just to, you know, to simmer them down. As soon as they sort of rise to the boil, what you need to do is just turn the gas down and just let them simmer. Stir them every kind of five or ten minutes just to make sure that the, you know, that they're, uh, you know, sort of not sticking at the bottom and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, the reason I've done this is because it's a lot more universal. I can use them for curries or chilies or, or pasta or, or anything like that. I could just get them out of the freezer, 
um, sort of bob them in, you know, whatever I'm doing, or defrost them overnight, and then and do it that way. What you can do if you want to make your um, life a bit easier, if you, if you want them for pasta sauces, you can put in onion and garlic and um, olives or whatever else you want to do. Then all you need to do then is basically just take it out, warm it up, put your pasta in, and away you go. Put a bit of cheese on the top, and you know, you know, within five minutes you've made yourself a meal. Um, the other thing that um, I have known people do is pretty much the same thing as I've done today, as I've shown you. Um, so put um, put your tomatoes and boil them down till they get to sort of you end up with about probably about half the volume as you start with to hundred with it um, and then as soon as you've driven off the water what you can do is add some vinegar uh, in there just a little bit of vinegar and you can jar it up you know sort of in you know sort of in jam jars but you need to put the vinegar in I'm not quite sure the recipe I've not done it myself this way but you but you put um, you can either put um, balsamic vinegar in or you can put um, the, the probably other vinegars you can, you can put in as well. You just put that in, stir it all in, and then just 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 sort of brings up to the boil, and obviously put it into sterilised um, jam jars, and you can keep it like that, just like ragu or or you know you know those the sort of sort of pasta sauces. Um, but to, as I say, what I do is I freeze it and then sort of take it out and then just add it to wherever I'm cooking, uh, and and you can put it in a whole raft of. Um, Different things. You can also leave it as it is and just use it like a um, as, as like a gravy or something like that. If you have a meal, you know you can just sort of use that as like a, a, a sauce to go with something else. So uh, you know there, there's a whole raft of um, uses for it. So anyway, that's that's a good way of using up your tomatoes. Okay, so these are the um, kestrel potatoes and. Uh, a lot of them are kind of sort of baking size, um, so I'm I'm not too uh, I'm not too disappointed with the crop at all. I I haven't actually measured these at the moment. What I'll do is I'll I'll weigh um, what there is and I'll and I'll put it across the bottom of the screen. I would imagine it's something like um, 12, 13, 14 kilos of potatoes, um, and this is out of I think there was um, 12, 12 or 13 plants in a row. So it's it's roughly a kilo per plant. Which isn't um, which isn't the best I've ever had it to be honest with you. I mean, I normally get um, I normally get you know sort of a bit more than that per plant. But uh, as I say, the majority of the potatoes are sort of reasonably big. Um, you know, there are some that are a little bit smaller. There are quite a few sort of little little teeny ones like that that are obviously haven't formed properly. And I think that's probably down to the fact that we've not had a lot of rain this year. But the ones that have developed, um, you know, have done really well. So. Um, these are. This is the row where I'd got um, two chits per, um, per per seed potato. So I was expecting these to be large anyway. Um, the other row is where I left all of the chits on. I'm more likely to get more sort of potatoes, kind of you know, kind of that size. Um, but uh, you know, out of the first row, I'm sort of reasonably impressed by that. And uh, there's plenty of bakers. I mean, they're a good, good sort of size for baking. Um, some of them are sort of reasonably, reasonably big. See that one's a bit knobbly, but uh, it'll bake up just the just the same. So uh, anyway, that's that's kestrel, uh, the first row of kestrel, which were the first to go in, and, um, and overall, I, th I think it's a pretty good crop. So here you are down at the uh, the run of beans. As you can see, they're they're coming thick and fast at the moment. Um, the uh, it's been a late start for the beans, but. Um, They've most certainly made up for it. I mean, if you come down, you know the branches are absolutely laden. The, you know, you don't need to look very far before you see, you know, great big clumps of them everywhere. And um, the one thing that you can do when your when your um, beans get to the top like this is um, I haven't actually done it so much this year as I did last year. But if you take out if you take out the runner, which is the basically the end bit there, basically all you need to do is just nip off, um, just put your thumb through it like that, and take off the top top it like that. What it'll actually do is encourage the beans to sort of bush out from the bottom so all of the uh, the, the beans that will come in a few weeks time um, will uh, you know will be sort of in more, more reachable rather than uh, um, you know than uh, you know than at the top where you have to sort of reach for them. But as you can see I mean these I'll, I'll, I'll be picking these tomorrow and sort of chopping all of these up. Um, some of them I've actually left on like these here, they, they've gone a little bit too far and I've also had some at the end as well, like these ones here, look that's that's most certainly gone a bit too uh, a bit too far. So well, obviously the ones that I've gone like that, obviously you know all of these are good to take off tomorrow, 
Um, I've got some at the end here. Um, that's that's probably uh, probably about borderline. That as soon as you start seeing that ridge forming at the back there, um, that's when you know you really do need to pick them. But um, these ones I've got here, actually like this one here, that one's both certainly gone too far. And all I've done now is just left left some of these on, um, left some of these on to uh, basically for seed next year. So I just fight my way up here. I know there's some more up here um, that have gone a bit too far. Um, I probably ain't going to be able to find them though. But uh, there are some more sort of coming up here. I must admit, what I would have done in hindsight was uh, made a little bit more room at the back. But uh, as you can see, all of them are good to chop up. Last week I actually picked, um, believe it or not, I actually picked um, 10 kilos of beans in one go. Um, and I literally stripped everything, everything down to even stuff that big. Um, obviously anything like this, I'd just sort of leave them on. Because um, that's going to take a, you know, if you if you see one kind of that size, i get the leaf out of the way, uh, if you can see one that size, that's going to take um, probably about a week or so to form. So that one's good for a week. Anything anything bigger than that, you know, most certainly anything that big, you know, you want to take that off. And that's probably probably about a quarter of an inch across, about six millimetres across. Anything like that, um, you know, is, is going to be a couple of days and it'll have, uh, you know, sort of grown to... You know something considerably bigger. You know, but so uh, if you are going away on holiday, you know it, it, it doesn't take. It takes about two or three days to get from that to to that, and obviously that's uh, that's that's just about uh, just at the right there. So um, obviously those will all be coming up tomorrow. But uh, that's what the beans look like at the moment. So I just want to do a few of the comments that have come over the last week or so. Um, first one comes from Brian Hubbery and he was talking about the uh, the tomato leaf um, pesticide. He said he's not used it before but um, he did put a comment on to say um, one thing that would be good if he did that was just to put a little bit of uh, washing up liquid in there and what that will do is it will label the um, Pesticide, uh, the pesticide um, stick to the, um, the, uh, the plants that you're spraying it on so just add a little bit of um, washing up liquid to basically get it to stick to the plant so thank you very much for your, um, your, your tip there. Next one comes from um, uh, Marina Wilson and she was talking about um, picking all of her uh, uh, marunna beans before she goes on holiday. Now I'm just about to go on holiday as, you know, as I've said so what I, would, what I would strongly suggest if anybody's going on holiday the best thing to do is just to strip completely the, uh, the runner beans, even some that are you know that are a little bit small, um, before you go away, uh, just 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 take them all off the plant, chop them all up, uh, you know as I was explaining the other day, you know just quickly blanch them and then freeze them and then obviously, um, you, you know if you have got somebody that can pick them for you and, uh, and obviously you know sort of store them all or whatever then that's good, but uh, if you are going away for a week or so, you can if you if you completely strip the plants of um, all of the sort of you know reasonably large beans, you can. Um, you know, sort of freeze them and then obviously the ones that come back hopefully you won't have too many that have gone too far. Okay, the next one comes from Tina at Allotment Garden. She was asking me about the um, the lavender comment that I um, um, said last week about how it's a, um, a slug repellent. And uh, what you can do is, is, is you can actually dry the lavender by um, put it in a, um, cut it off at the ground and then turn it upside down, put it inside a paper bag so it'll catch the, um, the little flower part, just tie a little bit of string around there just to hold the bag on, leave that in your shed to dry and what it'll do is it'll, it'll, it'll um, dry the uh, lavender and all you've got to do is just sort of, sort of crumble it up in, in your hand and what it'll do, all the sort of ends of the um, lavender will come off and what you can do as a slug repellent is just spread that on the ground and basically the slugs don't like it and also we'll see, whilst it's on the ground if they go over it then um, obviously you know they'll be sort of touching it and stuff like that so you can use it like that however if it does rain it's not going to be particularly strong, and the you know it'll it'll potentially wash it all away. But um, if you have got um, you know an area in your greenhouse or, or something where you don't water or anything like that, if you put lavender in there, it'll most certainly act as a repellent, and the slugs won't go on it. So you can use it like that. Uh, the next one comes from Nigel over in Wolverhampton, Muddy Boots, and he was saying um, he was saying his outdoor tomatoes have also done particularly better than the ones in the greenhouse. I mean, I, in all honesty, the tomatoes I've got in the greenhouse. Um, I've not been overly impressed with them um, this year. I've had one or two problems with the plants themselves, but uh, they've just seemed really, um, 
I don't know, they've really struggled this year, the tomatoes have inside, and I think it's probably the weather, in, in all honesty. I don't think I've done anything with the beds any different to what I normally do, and they're the same variety of tomatoes I always grow, I always grow money maker. These front ones here are, um, where are they, Alicante. Um, but they're just the same as the money maker at the back, so, you, you know, most certainly that's not any different. Um, and, you know, from a bearing fruit point of view, they haven't done too badly, but um, most certainly... Uh, the plants don't look anything like as healthy as they did last year or, or, or from years gone by. So uh, they don't look particularly sort of happy. But uh, the tomatoes outside have most certainly done better um, than the ones inside, which I was quite surprised about. I thought the ones outside would do quite as well. I thought they'd bear fruit, but I wasn't, I wasn't sure if they were going to ripen properly. Because um, I've had that problem in the past where, you know, you grow loads outside and you get loads of green tomatoes, but unfortunately they don't ripen very well. Um, but they have ripened, you know, I'm getting ripe fruit from outside, so... Um, so yeah, they've done really well outside this year. In fact, I'd say they've done better than the ones inside. So Nigel's also found that. Uh, the next one comes from Antonio Pachoco. Sorry if I pronounced that um, incorrectly, but uh, he was talking about the... Um, last week I made a comment about the tomatoes and I said, if you want your tomatoes to ripen, don't pick off all of the... Um, don't pick all of, all of the sort of ripe ones off because they're giving off a gas. And, and Antonio's um, left a comment to say that the actual gas that they give off is um, ethylene or um, ethene. Um, so I haven't, I haven't looked that up. That's, that, that's, I've just basically taken that straight off the comment. But yeah, they do give off a gas. So that was another reason why today, I don't know if you noticed, um, in, you know, in the clip, um, I took all of the tomatoes off, um, you know, because I'm going away. And what that will do is it'll stop the rest of them from, or, or at least slow down the rotting of the rest of them whilst I'm away. So uh, thank you for your um, comment, Antonio. Next one comes from Sandy Moth. And uh, she was saying um, that she's got some strawberries in her... Um, some, uh, I'm assuming they're um, um, sort of plastic boxes. She said they've gone from a fishmonger. To, I don't know if they're plastic or you can get some sort of polystyrene type boxes. Well, I wasn't quite sure, that, you know, what you've got. And she's saying that she's put her strawberries in there and they've, and they've grown and they've grown really well. And now they've stopped fruiting. Sort of how much should you water them? In all honesty, I don't, as soon as my tomatoes have fruited, I don't typically water them too honestly, unless it gets really, really dry and you can see the plants are starting to get a little bit stressed. What I, um, what I would suggest you do is um, leave them in the boxes um, and, and leave them outside. You don't need to bring them in or anything like that. Uh, just leave them in the boxes and just keep, just, just you know, once a week or so, just feel the soil. If the soil feels dry inside the box, then, then give it a bit of water. Um, if they're feeling, you know, sort of damp because you've had a bit of rain or whatever, then just leave them to it. But um, as long as they're sort of free draining and, um, you know, when they have got some moisture, they'll be perfectly happy. Um, strawberry plants don't take um, a lot of water whilst they're not, obviously when they're developing the fruit that's when they need the water. Um, when they're not um, developing fruit um, they don't need anywhere near as much water so all you've got to do really is just keep them damp. Um, you know, but uh, don't, don't worry about um, the watering too much. If they're outside Mother Nature's going to water them for you really to be honest with you. But I would just make sure that if they do run a little bit dry and you'll be able to tell by the look of the plants, you know, the plants will start to look a little bit withered or whatever, just give them a bit of water and they'll soon pick up. Okay, the next one comes from Jane, um, Jane Kelly, and Jane did make me laugh to be honest with you, because on <coughs> the second video last week I said uh, that I was chopping up the beans along with my family, and uh, I had to read it a couple of times before I actually realised what I'd said, but um, yes, yeah, so, you know, obviously chopping my family up, but um, thank you for that Jane, I was, I was, I was chortling a few, um, you know, for a few moments after, after uh, working out what, uh, what I'd said, but um, um, Jane's made a couple of comments. Um, she was saying that um, her tomatoes have also been considerably better outside than this year, and I think it's I think it's basically down to the weather. I think this weather's most certainly suited plants outside better than the greenhouse. The greenhouse really has suffered this year. Um, most certainly, the tomatoes, the the, uh, the cucumbers have suffered. Um, I mean, the, the the yield of cucumbers is nowhere near what it was last year, and also other plants. I think you know um, I had problems with the peas. Also, I had problems germinating. Um, some of the beans as well, and I've had some comments off um, some people I know. Um, Tina was saying that she had problems with her beans germinating as well because of the weather. Um, so it's just been one of them years. Um, <coughs> the other comment that um, that, that um, Jane made was um, her um, big Jim chili pepper. And look at mine; it's uh, pathetic. It's just got one left at the top, which is the only reason why it's in here. That's I'll probably take that off now, to be honest, and ditch that. But uh, yes, this was promising. Um, if you read the label, it's actually. Um, it actually says a whopping 25 centimetre long, 
peppers and that plant's been nurtured, it's been repotted, it's been watered and everything and that's the kind of peppers I've been getting off it so they're, they're about two inches long, about, about five centimetres if that. I have had, um, I have had uh, probably about to 12 chilies off there. Not particularly hot to be honest, I, I, I was quite surprised because on the, if you look at the label it says they're reasonably hot and they, they weren't that hot to be honest with you. But um, as I say I haven't watered it too much because it actually says on the label not to water it too much. Um, but um, it, it's, it's it's not done particularly well, perhaps it would have done better outside to be honest with you. But um, Jane was saying that she's also had um, a few of her chilies um, rot off on the plant. So um, I think that's probably down to uh, watering again. But uh, that's the comments for this week. The one thing that I really did want to say just at the end um, was I just wanted to say a th big thank you to everybody who's put um, uh, congratulations and everything on um, a thousand subscribers. Just a big thank you to everybody. And obviously all of the subscribers that watch, um, thank you for all of your support again. And um, here's the next thousand. So just a quick update on the ginger, as you can see it's in really well, it's up to sort of uh, about four foot high now. Now this one at the front here, unfortunately rotted off, um, I don't know why, um, probably the weather, but you can just see the top of it, top of it there, that's sort of come off, so I'm, I'm not uh, expecting much from that now. But as you can see these ones at the back here, they've sort of developed quite a sort of bulbous um, base to them, so that one's growing quite well. And then this one at the side here is just thrown up um, a second little shoot there. So what I will do is I will most certainly grow this again next year but what I'll do is because of the season in the UK I think what I'll do is I'll probably put it in a little bit um, earlier um, than I did this year. I'll probably try and get it in into the greenhouse by sort of May time and um, you know sort of grow it on but uh, it most certainly grows in the UK if you get it right so I'll, um, I'll give that a go again next year. So if you remember back uh, when I put the carrots in two weeks ago, um, I cut down the uh, the chives down to kind of this level here. And as you can see, over the last two weeks, the chives have grown pretty much from there up. All of this has grown in the last two weeks. So if you do cut your chives down, um, you will get fresh growth. Um, as soon as you've got the, the roots established in the ground, um, they'll grow up like this and you'll get um, a nice fresh um, crop of chives to have with your salad potatoes when you're making uh, potato salad. Really quick update on the uh, carrots, as you can see the carrots have all come through. So that I've got sort of six distinct rows now of the other uh, different types. Obviously I'm growing these, which are the F1 Rainbow, um, the F1 Purple Haze and the, uh, the Cosmic Purple, which is another um, new variety. So as you can see they've all come through. The uh, Most certainly the germination on the F1 Rainbow is really good. The, uh, the F1 Purple Haze is pretty good. The, uh, the germination on the uh, Cosmic Purple, which is the new variety, is not as strong. Uh, you can see them, they're just sort of here. I mean, time will tell, they may come up uh, a little bit later. They are coming um, amongst the weeds. But uh, as you can see, I've got some down there. So what I'll need to do in a week or so is just um, go up there and just pull, pull out the weeds and sort of thin them out a little bit and then uh, these will be uh, good for Christmas. So I just thought I'd show you these. These are the, um, these are the chickpeas and they're the, uh, the actual little pods there, look. And in each one of these pods there's two chickpeas. Now I actually took one off the other day and they haven't, um, they haven't quite formed inside. So um, that, that one feels a little bit harder, so it feels like there's something in there. But what I'm going to do is leave them until they've sort of gone a bit yellow. Um, as you can see, there's loads of them down, down here. Um, you can see down there as well. So there are plenty of chickpeas on there. If I, if I pick them all and pod them, I'm not quite sure how many I'm going to get, to be honest with you. Um, as I say, you know, it was, a, it was a, something to do for interest more than anything. But if you look underneath the branches, um, all you need to do is get like a branch like this, pull it off, and then underneath, as you can see, it's laden with uh, with uh, the chickpeas. There's some more forming on that one. So uh, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll give these another couple of weeks. Um, now some of these are sort of starting to go a bit yellow and drying out. I'm assuming that they're the ones that uh, are going to ripen off first. So what I'll do is wait till they've all gone a little bit yellow like that, and I'll um, pick them all and. Um, see what I get but you know you know at the end of the day you know you can you know you can go and buy 
a bag of dried chickpeas or, a, or even a can of chickpeas for, you know, sort of not very much money at all. You know, you can <clears throat> you can get a most certainly can of chickpeas for probably about 50p. So if you you know if you look at it from a financial point of view, they aren't worth growing really. But uh, I just did it for a point of interest really. Um, so that's what the chickpeas look like. So the pumpkins, as you can see, are in here. Uh, this one's starting to turn a little bit orange. That one there, and I've got a couple over here as well, as you can see. So they are growing. They're not nowhere near as big as I was expecting them to be, to be honest with you. As I say, they have been watered, um, but uh, I mean, they're big enough to, to carve, so that's all that matters, really. There are some more coming. Um, I mean, the leaves are nice and big, but uh, as you can see, there are some more coming sort of down, further down. So what I might do is um, take some of these these others off so it focuses on the uh, you know the, the, the larger ones here. Uh, the second batch of rhubarbs here I've actually um, picked about um, about 10 kilos of rhubarb in the last week, believe it or not. Um, the second the second batch that you get, which is always sort of in August time, um, is is never as good as the spring um, spring ones. But uh, you know the, the the shoots the shoots don't tend to be anywhere near as thick as they are in the spring. As you can see, that's probably about uh, probably about an inch or so across, probably a little bit less than an inch across. Um, even though the leaves are nice and big. Now I have harvested mainly up this side here, but um, if we just go up here. Um, so there should be some thicker ones up here. There are thick ones amongst them. I haven't harvested anything from here yet. As you can see there, that's sort of about an inch and a quarter across. And, uh, um, so that's, these are the ones I've been harvesting basically. The ones that are um, a bit wider. But um, ideal for your crumbles. OK, so where the potatoes were, I'm just putting the leeks in, and um, I've just got the leeks here, I've, I've just washed the, uh, the roots off, so you can see, there the, uh, there the leeks ready to go in, so I've got the roots, and I've basically made a, made a hole in the ground, um, about, about sort of seven or eight inches deep. Now what I'm going to do is just gently push that in, and then I'm going to water into the hole, and what that will do is it'll wash the roots down to the, um, to the bottom. So there's just one here off the sides of the camera. What you can do is uh, you can actually trim the trim the roots down slightly on the uh, the leeks. But what you want to do is get them reasonably far into the ground. Uh, you know you want the want the sort of the base of it like that to be, or at least the way I do it, at least kind of six inches into the ground. Now I don't know if you saw what I did there, but what I'm getting is uh, I'm getting the leek. I've already made the hole. Uh, just pulling off that leaf so I don't know if you can see what I'm doing is pushing it down into the hole all the way pull it back up and then back down again and what that'll do is it'll mean that the roots are at the bottom of the hole because the first time if you imagine the first time you put it down into the hole the roots will go like that and then when you pull it back up the roots then do that and then when you push it back down the roots end up going into the hole so uh, that's basically the way to get it into the hole so I'll just carry on doing this all the way along and all I need to do now is not push the dirt into the hole, just water with a watering can, water straight into the hole and then that will wash the dirt around the uh, the roots of the leeks. Okay so all you need to do basically is uh, just water sort of near the hole, um, don't go directly down the hole because what you can do is wash the, wash the leek down the hole, but uh, I don't know if you saw me do that, basically just, just water around the top of the hole and you'll find that the the earth. And it's ideal to put these in just after you've taken the potatoes out because the, the ground is really well dug and um, you know you've got all the weeds out and everything. Plus it's uh, nice and soft. Now, do you see how that one fell down the hole then a little bit? It will recover. It will grow back up. But uh, that's what you need to do. Just water around the hole and you're just kind of letting the, sort of the, the soil sort of collapse down into the hole and uh, cover the uh, the roots of the leeks.
Now I've had a little bit of a surprise this week. Um, this should be a pumpkin, but for some reason it's come out like that. Now I'm not sure if that's a marrow or what, I don't know if anybody can help me with this, but uh, this should be a pumpkin plant and um, it's come out like that. Obviously the seeds come out of a packet um, and it's the only one of its type, so it's, it, it's most certainly stripy, which is what makes me think it's a marrow, but uh, if you can uh, identify that for me I'd muchly appreciate that. As you can see all of the sunflowers are out and the it's actually got to the point now where the uh, the weather vane, I don't know if you can make it out, that's actually in there as well, um, but they're all they're all out and uh, um, looking really nice at the moment. And the tallest one of the lot, um, I'm not quite sure if those over there um, are actually tall, I've not measured them yet, but I've got a couple of tall ones over there. But um, I think this one here, um, just there, just walking around, I think that one's going to be the possibly the tallest this year, and that's probably going on for probably about three and a half metres in total. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll get out and measure that before too much longer. So, thank you for watching this episode of Jim's Love and Garden. I hope it's been of some use to you. And please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions that you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Love and Garden. Mm -hmm.